So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. So, my name is Tess, and I've spent the last four years working on blockchains. And uh, when you think of blockchains, you might think of the breathless hype that's led to scammy token sales and all kinds of other weird things like that. Um, but blockchains are also fascinating and novel distributed systems. And yes, they're weird because, look, blockchain people are the same people who decided that we should rewrite the entire financial system from first principles. So now just imagine that same impulse applied to distributed systems. And then consider uh, that a lot of people in the blockchain space have backgrounds in economics or finance or government, as well as people who are programmers or who come from computer science. So because of all of this, some people view blockchains as like dist distributed systems um, evil twin, this bizarre and backwards mere universe. But I think there's a unified narrative here because blockchains and traditional distributed systems cover a lot of the same ground, just motivated in different ways. So in other words, if we're being a little bit optimistic at least, they complement each other. They don't oppose each other. So I want to look through that lens today and look specifically at consensus algorithms. I think that there's a unified story here about how to get a bunch of computers to agree on something. So by bridging these worlds, I hope that blockchain people can gain an appreciation for the decades of research that have come before them, and distributed systems people can see the ways that a lot of these ideas have played out in the wild. And if you're not coming from either side, if you don't have any background or bias in any of this stuff, I hope that this is a pretty good introduction to the topic. So today, I hope to give you a sense of what the consensus problem is and how it can be solved. So let's begin, like good blockchain enthusiasts, from first principles. So we can imagine a system with five nodes, and all of these nodes can talk to each other, and each node has some slot for a value. And we want all the nodes to choose a value for that slot, and that value should be the same across the entire system. So in other words, we want this system to come to consensus on some value. So how can we do this? Well, naively, we could propose, uh, or we could have one node propose some value x to every other node in the system. And once all of those other nodes say, okay, yes, good, our proposer node can adopt x as its value, and then all of the other nodes can adopt x as well. And this will work, but we have a couple of problems here too. For example, what if this other node wants to suggest a value y? at the same time that this first node is suggesting x? Or what if there's a network partition where some of the nodes can't reach one another anymore? Or what if there's just like a lot of nodes, right? It would take a really long time for any proposer node to reach out to every other node and hear back every time there's some change in the system. Or what if one of the nodes goes offline? Um, our proposer node could then wait forever, waiting for that other node to come back. So finally, there's a lot of other things that could go wrong too, but I won't go into them here. So broadly speaking, consensus algorithms are the solution to this problem. But what exactly is a consensus algorithm? At this point, you might have a little bit of an intuitive, know it when you see it definition of a consensus algorithm in the same way that you might have a know it when you see it definition of the word blockchain or of the word cloud. And just as there are narrower or more generous definitions of blockchains, there are also narrower or, or broader definitions of the consensus problem. So we can define the consensus problem in a strong or in a weak way. So let's look first at a strong or strict formulation of the consensus problem, since any solution for a stronger problem should also solve the weaker problems at the same time. So in this strict world, every node in the system must eventually decide on a value. That value has to be the same across every node. And that value has to have been produced by some process. So these three formal sounding properties have three formal sounding names, termination, agreement, and validity, respectively. But that doesn't sound so strict, huh? Um, in fact, that five node example was trying to solve this strict formulation of the problem. But this is all easier said than done, 
And in fact, some of the algorithms that I will show you later today may not solve such a strict formulation of the problem. But I want to begin by discussing an algorithm that does solve this strong consensus problem, one of the oldest consensus algorithms, and it's called Paxos. Now, if you've heard of Paxos, you may have also heard of the trouble with Paxos, which is that no one actually understands it, people say. In fact, in a paper introducing another consensus algorithm, which is called RAFT, the authors explain that they went to an academic conference and they surveyed people, and they found that almost no one could answer questions about Paxos's nuances. In fact, they say, they themselves didn't really understand it until they spent a year designing an alternative protocol. So that probably sounds extremely daunting, but I'm going to show you how Paxos works anyways. And before I do that, I want to make something clear, which is just that the trouble with Paxos comes from the fact that a lot of its behavior is unspecified. In the original Paxos paper, a lot of the behavior, um, or a lot of the details are left as kind of an exercise to the reader. So it's pretty difficult to implement correctly. And so to accommodate that, there are dozens of variations many of which are quite complex themselves. But basic Paxos is actually pretty intuitive. It addresses all of the problems that I described earlier just by building on top of that first naive solution. So <clears throat> the first naive solution relied on a single node proposing a new value to all of the other nodes in the system, and Paxos works in roughly the same way too. In Paxos, consensus rounds are organized by ballots, and the proposing node sends out a ballot that the other nodes will vote on. So let's begin by looking more closely at a node. In Paxos, our node no longer has a single slot for the value. Now it has three slots. One is for the value, as before, but uh, there's two new numbers that it has to track, too. The number of the ballot that this node has most recently prepared, and the number of the ballot that this node has most recently accepted. So we can say for now that both of these values, let's call them n. So to understand why we have to keep track of all of these things, let's go back to this five-node system. In this example, all of these nodes can both be proposers and acceptors. So they can both propose new values and vote on whether or not to accept them. And in a more complex system, you can imagine that we might also have observer nodes who can talk to these acceptors and just learn what the state of the system should be. So now let's say that one node would like to update the value. So it sends off a message to all of the other nodes in the system. Prepare the ballot n prime, where n prime is the ballot number that follows n, right? So notice that the proposing node also sends a message to itself um, because it can also vote on, on these ballots. It's also an acceptor. And if it's helpful, you can think of this prepare message as a warning that change is coming to the system. When the nodes receive this prepare statement, they check it against the largest ballot number that they've previously prepared. So in this case, they can see that n prime is greater than n, so they will act or acknowledge the ballot. In other words, they're telling the proposer that they've never prepared a later ballot, so it's okay to proceed with this one. Everything okay back there? <laughs> um, anyway, at this point, the proposing node needs to count the number of acts it's received. So if it's received acts from a majority of nodes or a number of nodes that we call a quorum, it can proceed with the ballot. So now the proposing node sends out another message to all of the nodes. Accept the ballot n prime. And you should think of this message as a command. It's telling the other nodes that they need to accept this ballot. And this message doesn't have just the ballot number. It also has that value that the nodes are actually supposed to adopt. So in this case, that's x. So once a node receives the accept command, it will update its value to be x, unless it's already received a new ballot with a higher ballot number, in which case it will stop and wait for the rest of that new ballot. OK, so all of this might seem a little bit needlessly complicated, but now that we're armed with this multi-stage consensus process, let's see how some of those failure scenarios play out. So first, let's look at what happens if a node goes offline. Let's say that this proposing node sends out its prepare statement, but this other node goes offline before it can respond. It's offline, right? Okay. Um, so all of the other nodes will still be able to send their acts back to the proposer. 
And when that proposer counts its acts, it will see that it's received responses from a quorum of nodes. So it can proceed and finish the round. But as a more complex example, let's look at what happens if two nodes propose values at the same time. So let's imagine that both of these nodes send messages to prepare the ballot. The first proposer's messages are these solid lines, and the second proposer's messages are these dotted lines. So this is where ballot numbers come into play. So far, I've always called the ballot number n or n prime, but in Paxos, they're actually a little bit more complicated than that. In Paxos, ballot numbers have this important property of being totally ordered, which means that for any two ballot numbers, one has to come before or after the other. You can't have two conflicting ballot numbers. And just as an aside, this is usually done by making ballot numbers a tuple of two numbers. So first, some kind of counter, and then second, a unique identifier for the node. So that way, even if two nodes propose ballots with matching counters, their unique identifiers will give the ballots a total ordering. OK, so with all of that in mind, let's look at this again. So we can call this proposer A and this other proposer B. So this one proposer is sending out a prepare statement for the ballot n prime A, and the other one is sending out a ballot for n prime B. And we know that A is before B, so the ballot from B will always win because it comes after the ballot from A. So after A and B send out their prepare statements, every node will only send an ACK in response to the statement with the latest ballot number. So they'll send an ACK back in response to proposer B, but not to A. So only proposer B will receive ACKs from a majority of acceptors, and only it will have a quorum, and only it can continue with the ballot process. So the proposer A has to stop because it didn't receive enough ACKs. So now this proposer can send out an accept command with the new value, and all of the nodes will adopt that value. So that's great. We've maintained consistency across all of the nodes. But the devil's in the details, and while I've presented what I think is a pretty good high-level overview of Paxos, there are lots of corner cases in, this, in these examples, as well as entirely separate failure scenarios like network partitions. But with Paxos out of the way, I'd like to turn back to Raft. Remember Raft? Raft is the paper that introduced itself by talking about how complicated Paxos is. And I want to talk about Raft, too, because it's an important algorithm in its own right, and lots of things use Raft. Etcd and console are, are two of the popular ones. And also, by talking about Raft, we get to explore a few more interesting ideas from consensus land. So, Raft tackles the consensus problem by introducing the concept of a leader. The leader is a node who's responsible for updating the state of the system. And really, they're the only node that's allowed to pick the next value that the system will adopt. If a different node receives an instruction to set a value, it can just forward that instruction to the leader, which will then decide if the system will adopt it or not. But how do we know who's the leader, right? So Raft solves this problem, too, by giving us an algorithm for leader election. So this algorithm is fair. Like, none of the nodes are more likely to become the leader than other ones. Um, and importantly, it ensures that there's no more than one leader at any given time. So in this algorithm, every node can be in one of three states. It can be a follower, it can be a candidate, or it can be the leader. And when a node joins the network, it starts out as a follower, and it expects to hear a heartbeat from the network's leader. After a while, if it doesn't hear a heartbeat, it assumes that the leader is dead, and it will announce its own candidacy for leader and transition into candidate mode. And then, naturally, this node will begin soliciting votes. So obviously, it begins by voting for itself, but then it sends a request to every other node, asking for its vote, too. If this candidate node receives votes from a majority of the other nodes, then it becomes the new leader. So <clears throat> in addition to adding this concept of a leader, Raft also explicitly introduces the idea of a replicated log. In Paxos, you might implicitly understand that there's some sort of log of all of the values that the system has adopted in order, but it's not mentioned explicitly. 
or at least it's not mentioned explicitly in the simplest form of Paxos. And this replicated log also exists in the blockchain world, which I'll get back to in a minute, um, because this log is the blockchain itself. Anyway, in Raft, you might imagine the replicated log like this. A long list of entries where each entry has the value for the log along with a term number and an index. So terms are the period of time between each election, which means that each term can only have one leader, and the index is just the position of this entry in the log. So these numbers function a little bit like the ballot numbers in Paxos, just in, this, in that we use them to keep track of everything and to make sure that everything stays in order, right? So the network uses the term number and the index to impose a rule that all of the nodes have to follow. And it's called the log matching property, which in turn is composed of two invariants. So the first part of the log matching property says that if two entries in different logs have the same index and the same term number, then they must store the same command. And this follows kind of naturally from the fact that a leader can only create one entry with a given index and term and entries can't be reordered in the log. The second part of the log matching property says that if two entries in different logs have the same index and the same term number, then the logs are identical in all of the preceding entries. So unlike the first invariant, this second invariant doesn't really follow naturally. Instead, it has to be guaranteed by a consistency check that happens every time the leader tells the followers to add a new log entry. When the leader wants the followers to append a new entry, it will also send along the index and the term number of the last entry that it's committed. So the followers will then check their own logs for a matching entry, and if they don't have it, they refuse to add this entry. And this will tell the leader that it needs to replay more of the previous entries to this follower. So all of this creates consistency rather inductively, right? So I think it's easier to understand how this works by walking through a failure scenario, similar to the one, ones that we uh, examined when talking about Paxos. So in this example, node A begins as the leader. And let's say that our last log entry was at index one. So our network will look something like this. Then node A will send out these two messages, one that comes after index one and has the command X, and the other one that comes after index two and has the command Y. And note that each message also has the index and the term of the previous entry. So nodes B, C, and D receive them and apply them to their log, but node E never receives them, maybe due to a network partition or something. So now our network looks like this. You can see that everyone is at index three except for poor node E who's stuck in the past. So then imagine that node A crashes, which you can kind of see behind these commands, um, and node B manages to get elected leader. Now let's say that node B tries to send out a message at index three with the command Z. Node E will reject that message since the highest committed index, which is three, is missing from its log. So this rejection will cause node B to broadcast the messages from after index one and after index two um, back to node E so that node can apply the changes and then catch up. So once this whole process is done, we've maintained consistency, even after a few major hiccups, like our leader failing during a network partition. And that's pretty good. OK, so this is a good time to take a step back and look at this little universe of consensus algorithms. This is what we have so far. We have a problem, the consensus problem, and we have these two solutions, Paxos and Raft. And there are more, but this is what we've talked about so far. But you might have also noticed that both Paxos and Raft rely on every participant following the rules. For example, proposers in Paxos never send out accept statements for ballots they haven't prepared, and voters in Raft never vote twice in the same term. So that kind of failure, where nodes stop following the rules and start behaving maliciously, is called a Byzantine failure. Byzantine failure is named after the Byzantine general's problem, which is a classic computer science problem formulated as a parable. And just as an aside, academic computer scientists really love doing this kind of thing. They really love creating fake historical narratives to illustrate challenges in computing. 
So for example, Paxos is named after a Greek island because its author invented a Greek, ancient Greek democracy that used the Paxos algorithm to vote. And he also tried to teach this algorithm to his students by dressing up like Indiana Jones and pretending that he discovered this ancient society on an archaeological dig. I guess he stopped doing this performance, though, because he later said that although everyone remembered Indiana Jones, no one, remember, re no one remembered the algorithm. Anyway, in the Byzantine generals problem, there are some generals who have surrounded a city, and they're trying to decide if they'll attack or hold back. And some of the generals want to attack, and other ones want to hold back, but the important thing is that they all decide what to do together. Because if only some of the generals attack, um, they're doomed, right? And that would be much worse than a coordinated retreat. The thing that makes this tricky is that there could be malicious generals who can selectively tell different things to other generals. For example, if the generals are split down the middle, the malicious general might tell the generals who want to attack that they should, and tell everyone else that they should hold back, and then half the generals would attack, and the whole thing would be a failure. As a simple technical example, you can imagine that a proposer node could ask other nodes to prepare a ballot with a number far in the future, and it would just freeze them until that ballot rolled around. So how can we address Byzantine failure? Well, just as we built Paxos up from our first naive solution, we can build up another algorithm that looks an awful lot like Paxos, but with a more descriptive name. And that's Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance, or PBFT. Like Paxos, PBFT requires nodes to go through a multi-step voting process, but now it becomes even more complex. It introduces more rounds of voting and even more types of nodes. So this diagram shows all of the messages that need to be sent in order to tolerate a single Byzantine fault during a single vote. In fact, it's complex enough that this other paper, which puts practical in scare quotes, was published 12 years later, warning people that PBFT might just be too tricky to use in production. So I won't go into much detail on PBFT, partly because it is complex, and partly because there are other interesting solutions to the Byzantine General's problem. Nonetheless, PBFT is an important algorithm in our consensus constellation, so at this point, it's safe to add PBFT. Um, it both solves the consensus problem and can handle Byzantine faults, so we'll put it in this new Byzantine safe box. PBFT keeps working as long as fewer than one third of the nodes are misbehaving. And this sounds pretty good until you realize that now we have another problem, which is what stops an attacker from just spinning up a bunch of new nodes that can behave in malicious ways? This is called a Sybil attack, and classically, PBFT prevents it by forcing nodes to negotiate their membership up front. In other words, new nodes can't join. And this might be okay for a lot of use cases, but now I want to tilt back towards blockchains. And an algorithm that doesn't let nodes join doesn't really work for a public blockchain network, which is supposed to be open for anyone to join at any time. So now we need another box in our universe, a Sybil safe box. What can we put in here? Well, since we're talking about blockchains, let's look at the oldest one. How does Bitcoin handle consensus? Can we put Bitcoin's consensus strategy into the Sybil safe box? And in short, yes, Bitcoin uses Nakamoto consensus, which relies on proof of work. So in Nakamoto consensus, every validator node composes a new candidate block from all of the pending transactions. The node then attempts to guess a nonce that when combined with the block contents can be hashed to produce a value that's smaller than some threshold. If you've been paying attention to Bitcoin, you might know these validator nodes as miners. So some of the language changes here because now we're stepping away from the world of academic distributed systems and into the world of blockchains. But even though the language changes, a lot of the ideas remain the same. So let's go back to our old five node system and have it run proof of work this time. In this example, you can see that all of our nodes have made some guesses. And after some time, this miner finds a nonce that produces a suitably small hash. So at this point, it can broadcast the nonce and the hash and the block to all of the other nodes in the system 
and the whole system can advance to the next block. So that means that everyone starts the whole process all over again, and each node starts trying to guess a new nonce that can be hashed along with the contents of some new block to produce a suitably small value. So one notable thing about proof of work is that it's fair. The miner that gets to identify the next block will be randomly chosen, or at least chosen in proportion to the amount of hashing power that each miner has. And proof of work provides some historical safety too because it costs so much energy and takes so much time to find a valid hash to, pr to produce a new block that it would be just infeasible to try to rewrite any old blocks. As in other systems, not every node in this system has to act as a proposer, but one neat thing about proof of work is that non-proposer nodes can easily check the miner's work by hashing each block and checking it against the hash. So, now it's safe to put proof of work in our Sybil safe box. But proof of work has some problems, both problems in theory and problems in practice. Let's talk first about the theoretical problem with proof of work. So as a reminder, any algorithm that solves the consensus problem has to have these three properties, termination, agreement, and validity. And let's keep this definition in mind as we imagine a scenario where two different nodes propose different blocks at the same time. Let's call these blocks the purple block and the red block. And they're both valid. Because if there's a sufficient number of miners who are all frantically guessing nonces and hashing blocks, it's very possible that two separate miners can each produce different yet valid nonces and blocks. So in this situation, it's possible that some of the other nodes choose to build on the red block and some of them choose to build on the purple block. This kind of divergence is called an accidental fork to distinguish it from a different kind of situation where the network has forked through a deliberate act rather than through an accident of consensus. And in theory, a network undergoing an accidental fork could just diverge infinitely, violating agreement, one of those three properties required to have strict consensus. However, in Bitcoin, nodes are incentivized to avoid this problem. So the network is programmed to consider the longest chain the valid one. So if the chain built on the purple block becomes longer than the one built on the red one, even by just one block, the nodes mining on the red chain will hop over and start mining on the purple chain instead. They'll orphan the red block and any other blocks built after it. So this is why people who use Bitcoin are advised to wait for 10 blocks to land before considering their transaction finalized. After 10 more blocks, it's extremely unlikely that the network will orphan the block that has your transaction in it. In fact, it's unlikely for that to happen after just one or two more blocks, because almost all of these accidental forks are resolved after just one more block. So even though there's a theoretical risk of breaking agreement, the network is almost certain to reconverge pretty quickly. Accidental forks don't pose much of a practical problem, and really, they're just the price that proof of work pays for simplicity and availability. But there are problems still, other problems, practical problems. One problem comes in the form of tricks, like ASICs, that nodes can use to increase their hash power, and by extension, increase the likelihood that they get to propose the next block. And not every proof of work blockchain is vulnerable to this, because the vulnerability does depend on the specific hash function, but this does make consensus rounds less fair. And more importantly, it's just infamously expensive to run. So all of these articles about how Bitcoin is ruining the environment are based on the energy needed to calculate and recalculate all of those hashes. So at this point, we might look again at our little universe and create a new target. Is it possible to have a consensus algorithm that is both Sybil safe and doesn't boil the ocean? It turns out, yes, one of the most popularly mentioned options is proof of stake, which is the consensus flavor that Ethereum is moving to in its final stage. And I say flavor because proof of stake isn't a single algorithm, but really a family of them. Some proof of stake algorithms are like proof of work in that they determine the next proposer node in a probabilistic way. But in proof of work, nodes can increase their odds by increasing their hash power and in proof of stake, nodes increase their odds by increasing their stake. So depending on the implementation, this can either be the amount that the node holds 
or it can be the amount that has been put into some kind of security deposit. And if that's the case, if a proposer node misbehaves, it can be fined through its security deposit. But how can we know if a proposer node has misbehaved? Maybe we need a way to let the other nodes vote on whether a proposer node is suggesting valid values. And that word, vote, should be bringing you back to Paxos and PBFT. And in fact, there are consensus algorithms that combine the strengths of both proof of stake and PBFT. A popular option is Tendermint, which lets nodes vote on proposed blocks using a technique that looks a lot like PBFT. And as you might remember, the big problem with PBFT is that it's vulnerable to Sybil attacks, where an attacker creates a lot of nodes that can overpower consensus rounds with malicious votes. Well, Tendermint protects against these attacks by using proof of stake. A node must first put up some collateral before it can become a proposer, which really increases the cost of entry into the network. And then if it behaves maliciously, its collateral is slashed. So in other words, it just becomes very expensive to attack the network. But there's one last issue that all proof of stake systems have, and that's that they tie consensus power directly to resources. Those who have the most resources, have the most capital, have the most control over network consensus. And that might be fine for a lot of applications, but what can you do if you want to decouple resources from consensus? So let's add another box to our universe to capture this important property. Proof of stake systems are a little kleptocratic. Proof of work systems are not. So this is where yet another family of consensus algorithms comes in handy. And that's federated consensus, which leverages pre-existing systems of trust. So we can add to our universe a concept of trust, which neither proof of stake nor proof of work require. So my favorite federated consensus algorithm is SCP, or the Stellar Consensus Protocol. And of course, this is where I insert the little disclaimer, because I do work for a company that builds on the Stellar network. But SCP is cool, it's genuinely cool, because it uses a voting system that's similar to Paxos or PBFT, but instead of using proof of stake to determine membership in the set of validating nodes, it lets other nodes choose which nodes to trust. So here's another way you can think about it. In a closed system, like Paxos or PBFT, we have this concept of a quorum, which is the number of votes you need to consider a value prepared or accepted. So a quorum is typically a majority or a supermajority of nodes in the network, but in an open network, where the number of nodes can fluctuate and attackers can create spurious extra nodes, in this environment, the concept of majority is kind of meaningless. So in this kind of system, how can we create a quorum? Well, the approach that SCP takes is to let each node choose its own quorum. So that is, each node takes a bit of a parochial view and considers a value accepted once, an, once enough of the other nodes in its personal quorum have accepted that value. So in this example, this node's quorum looks just like the Paxos quorum I showed you um, earlier, but these three nodes would continue to be a parochial quorum even if many more nodes joined the network. So this strategy works especially well for Stellar, which was designed to be a system for cross-border payments and remittances, or put more generally, is a medium of exchange for third-party tokens. On a system like Bitcoin or Ethereum, third-party tokens are usually implemented using smart contracts, but Stellar was designed from day one for multiple different currencies or multiple different assets. Um, and these third-party tokens are created by trusted issuers. So if you're already trusting issuers to remain solvent and redeem your tokens, why not trust them to manage consensus too? Or more concretely, imagine that you decide to agree on a transaction when your counterparties and issuers do. You would then transitively build this network of trusted nodes. So this might sound a little bit far-fetched, but the literal internet is proof that these transitively trusted networks can emerge. Since ISPs are decentralized decision makers, they could have diverged and created many separate internets. But because everyone wants to talk to everyone else, they didn't. So as an example of how this works, let's look at this network, um, where some of these nodes trust A as an issuer and some of them trust B. But B also trusts A because it wants to transact with A's token. 
So when A declares that a transaction has happened, these three nodes adopt it. And when this last node sees that B has adopted it, it adopts it as well. So from all of this, we can see that SCP fits here in our consensus algorithm universe. It does require more trust than a proof of work algorithm, but it's also much cheaper to run. It admits that not all consensus problems can be solved with computers alone. And even proof of stake systems admit this a little bit, because when a new node joins a proof of stake system, it has to ask a pre-existing node for the system's current state, and it has to trust that. So let's recap this landscape. Today, we've talked about Paxos, which is one of the older consensus algorithms and maybe not as complicated as it seems. We've talked about Raft, which is a rethinking of Paxos with similar guarantees around safety and liveness. We talked about PBFT, which adds the additional guarantee of Byzantine fault tolerance so it can handle some bad behavior from nodes in the network. But none of these algorithms are Sybil safe. So none of them are appropriate choices for an open network, like Bitcoin, or Ethereum, or Stellar. So we looked at three other kinds of algorithms, proof of work, proof of stake, and federated consensus. And each of them comes with their own trade-offs. So there's this theorem from academic computer science. It's called the CAP theorem. It's about 20 years old, and the CAP theorem says that any distributed system cannot have consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. At most, a system can have two out of three. And after learning about all of these algorithms, Paxos, Raft, PBFT, everything, maybe you can start to see how this would emerge. And maybe you can start to see another necessary trade-off emerge, this time for public blockchains, the trade-off between efficiency, fairness, and minimized trust. So proof of work minimizes trust and prioritizes fairness but at the cost of efficiency. Proof of stake prioritizes efficiency and minimizes trust, but it's not fair to those who have fewer resources. Finally, federated consensus, like SCP, prioritizes fairness and efficiency, but it requires nodes to choose other nodes to trust. So I'm not saying that this set of trade-offs mirrors the CAP theorem, because I don't think that the blockchain world mirrors the academic distributed systems world. These worlds are intertwined, and the algorithms across the spectrum are all designed to solve the same problems, just in different ways and making different trade-offs for different applications. So I hope that today I've given you a healthy appreciation of all of these trade-offs and of the ways in which the blockchain world dovetails with the more traditional distributed systems world. Thank you very much. Um, These are uh, all of the, well, most of the references I, oh, most of the references I used, I also tweeted all of them. So if you want to just click on them, it's, it's easier, easier that way too. But thank you again. Yeah, and now I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, we have some questions. Um, okay, I have actually not heard of proof of capacity. So um, I, uh, I have no thoughts on it, I guess, because I'm not familiar with it. Does someone want to tell me what it is in a sentence? Uh, sorry? Uh, just a minute. <laughs> it's like mining with disk space. So uh, since disk space is cheaper than computing power, sure. it's uh, supposed to be more fair. Yeah, I mean, I think there, I have heard of, I haven't looked in depth, I've heard of a number of, you know, um, sort of blockchain-centric algorithms that are all sort of like proof of something, right? And they're all basically like, if you demonstrate that you have committed whatever resource to the problem, then we kind of trust you. Um, but I don't actually know, I haven't like looked deeply at any of them and I don't have um, strong opinions on any of them. I also don't think any of them are used super broadly yet. So I think it's all sort of early research, um, and I'm excited to see how it, how it plays out. Thanks. Um, yeah, do you think blockchain adoption will pick up anytime soon? This is like the big question of my life, actually, so um, I really wish uh, for your sake and for mine that I had a good answer. Um, I think that, 
I, I think that definitely blockchains will be very important. I'm not sure that they're going to be important in the like, every person on Earth's life is transformed by blockchains, which I think a lot of blockchain people like think that. And I don't really see that happening anytime soon. Um, but I do think they're really like important and interesting databases. And like, that's pretty significant. So even if people don't sort of have their lives revolutionized immediately, like, I still think they're, they're important and will be more important as time goes on. Um, useful, non-academic use. I mean, I think, so my whole background is working with blockchains um, to be sort of like better payment rails. Um, and I think that's like the obvious commercial use for them. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit less familiar or less like, like I would not put my word behind some of the other use cases for blockchains as like more generalized databases. Um, I, I think like databases for money or distributed databases for value, um, which again, like sounds narrow compared to all of the things that people have said about blockchains, but like a better distributed database for money is actually a huge thing. Um, so yeah, proof of authority, uh, same, same thing I said earlier. Uh, I, I've heard of proof of authority. Um, it sounds, my impression from reading about proof of authority briefly was that it was like best suited for permissioned systems actually. So it was like more in, uh, like on the spectrum, it sort of falls in between uh, like the Paxos Raft kind of family of things. Like maybe you, um, you vet your set up front and then you uh, like can tolerate a certain amount of, of, of Byzantine um, behavior. So I guess like closer to PBFT in that way. But um, yes, okay. Uh, how to apply blockchains in voting for politicians um, I do not know. Uh, I worked a few years ago on a, um, well, tangentially worked on a proof of concept for corporate voting, which is obviously not the same thing as like government political voting, but probably share some background. Um, and what we found with that was that because um, votes actually don't necessarily have the same properties that money should have, blockchains were not as strong a fit for the use case. Um, again, not the same thing as political voting, but maybe related. Um, why are ASICs unfair? Um, I don't literally mean unfair, like in the grand scheme of the world, you can say, you know, um, 